Good morning. I'm Ellen Futter, President of the American Museum of Natural History, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the museum and to this fantastic Rose Center for Earth and Space. We are delighted to host the Association of Space Explorers for this important event on such a hot topic, asteroids and the potential threat of near-Earth objects. And for anyone out there who is tweeting, our hashtag is Asteroid Defense. This event is especially timely because we here at the museum are about to open a new Hayden Planetarium space show on another hot topic in astrophysics titled Dark Universe. The new space show explores dark matter and dark energy, the mysterious stuff and force that make up so much of the cosmos. Dark Universe opens to the public on November 2nd, so I hope that many of you will come back to see it. And for any media in the room who would like information about the special media screenings or opportunities to see Dark Universe, please seek out someone on our communication staff who's in the room. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce the moderator of today's event, Frederick P. Rose, director of the Hayden Planetarium, and one of truly the most outstanding interpreters of science for the public, Neil deGrasse Tyson. You know, people always say that someone needs no introduction. Neil really doesn't need an introduction, but nonetheless, he deserves one. He is the author of 10 books, most recently, Space Chronicles, Facing the Ultimate Frontier. He was the host of PBS's Nova Science Now for five seasons, and his new TV series, a 2014 version of Carl Sagan's Cosmos, will premiere next spring on Fox. He is also the narrator of our soon-to-open space show on Dark Universe. It is my great pleasure now to introduce Neil Tyson. Members of the welcome members of the press. Welcome members of the press and other passers-by. Uh, we're meeting this week primarily because uh, this press conference relates to sessions that are going on now at the United Nations across town, and one of those sessions relates to the threat of asteroids on the uh, security of our species on this planet. And we have a panel of distinguished. I'm going to call them guests. They've all been in space. A panel of distinguished astronauts, I'm going to bring them all up right now, and I'll introduce them individually uh, w when they give their presentation. Please come on up, all five of them. Thank you. So if I just give a brief uh, statement of the problem, we live in a solar system on a planet called Earth. And it was not known until 1800 that there were other kinds of objects in the solar system that would not deserve the name of planet. They left no mark, no visible extent of a disk on a photographic plate. So they look like points of light as a star would appear on a photograph, as a point of light. But we knew they were not stars because they were orbiting the sun between Mars and Jupiter. And so the name it was invented for them, and they're called asteroids, star-like. And that's where asteroid got its name. We discovered that there weren't just a few of them, as were initially found, but there's swarms of them, most of them orbiting between Mars and Jupiter. And some of them, a subset of them, have orbits that come in a little too close and cross the orbit of Earth around the sun. And so this conference, this press conference, which is entirely derived from the efforts of these gentlemen and others who are concerned about the safety hazards of asteroids striking Earth and rendering our civilization extinct or disabling our civilization so that we have to jumpstart all that is fundamental about it. And let's get straight into this. I'm going to first introduce uh, Tom Jones. He's a shuttle era astronaut. And Tom, why don't you start off uh, with your presentation? Thank you, Neil, and thank you to the uh, American Museum of Natural History for welcoming uh, the Association of Space Explorers here. Uh, the association is the society, the professional society of astronauts and cosmonauts 
from around the globe. And we have an uh, international represent representation here in our Committee on Near-Earth Objects, which is concerned with preventing a future asteroid strike. So we are very glad to be working with Neil and his planetarium and the museum uh, today to talk about this important issue. Um, our organization, the Association of Space Explorers, has an educational mission. It has a technology mission to further spaceflight technology and exploration of the, the solar system and the universe. But we also have an environmental mission, environmental protection, and our unique perspective of seeing the Earth from space. We've all been up in orbit, and we've seen impact craters around the globe as we've circled our planet. And we want to expand this environmental mission to preventing uh, a future asteroid strike and the effects on our human civilization. So that's why we're here, and that's why we've been working together for the last uh, well, six or seven years on this uh, asteroid prevention mission. Now, as Neil mentioned, uh, the General Assembly is meeting this week at the UN. Uh, its uh, fourth committee has uh, adopted a report from the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. And on the slide here, you see these important steps that were adopted this week by the United Nations. Now, our organization has been helping these UN discussions about preventing an asteroid strike uh, over the last half dozen years. And we made some suggestions back in 2008 uh, and submitted them to the UN in 2009. It's a report called Asteroid Threats, and you have a copy here that's available in the back. Uh, the Asteroid Threats report suggested to the UN that it takes several concrete measures to uh, further decision making on preventing an asteroid strike. And they were very successful over these last few years at bringing these to actual concrete action. So the UN has adopted these measures uh, this week, and the final approval will come uh, before the end of the month. International Asteroid Warning Group has been set up so that the nations around the world will share asteroid detection information, their orbits, and their impact predictions. And this outfit will also warn the international community of potential impacts. And this consists of telescopes and scientists and space agencies around the world already working together. Uh, the new step here is the formation of this network and a subsidiary impact advisory group. And this impact advisory planning group will help disaster response organizations around the world respond in case there's a threat from a real asteroid heading our way. Um, you might also look at the space missions planning and advisory group that was set up. Uh, that's in the uh, bottom left corner of this diagram that shows how the UN has uh, uh, put these steps into, into action. This is a group that's going to uh, prepare mission options and look at mission technologies, how you would actually deflect an, an asteroid in the future. And that planning that that group does will then be available for the world's space agencies to work together to, to actually deflect a rogue object. And finally, uh, the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space uh, is going to uh, monitor these threats from asteroids, take note of them, advise the, the global community, and uh, help plan a deflection campaign if, if that's necessary. And it's appropriate, I think, when talking about the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space to introduce one of our guests here today. We have the chairman of the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Sa Sp Space, Mr. Yasushi Horikawa. Would you stand up, sir? Thank you. Another gentleman who's helped with uh, bringing these steps to the UN and having them uh, become rea real is uh, uh, Mr. Michael Simpson. And Mike is the executive director of the Secure World Foundation. And he has aided us in these discussions at the UN. We also have a couple of other astronauts. There's Dr. Don Pettit in the back, a space station flyer, and uh, Dr. Tammy Jernigan here, who was one of my crewmates on the space shuttle. So they're involved in our asteroid and association of space explorer activities too. And working together, the UN has actually brought about these uh, steps on asteroid prevention. And so you've, talk, you've seen this network of telescopes in action making impact predictions uh, already. Uh, and that's going to be succeeded by this impact disaster advisory group helping us deal with an actual impact event like we saw in Chelyabinsk last winter. And finally, uh, we're going to do the planning now in the future with these UN steps of how to actually deflect a rogue object heading towards Earth. Now, our group has made some suggestions for future action, and I hope we'll get to those in the discussion as we wrap up at the end of the talk. Let's move on, Neil. Excellent. Thanks, Tom. Uh, next up is Apollo-era astronaut Rusty Schweikert. He flew Apollo 9 in 1969, and he's one of the founders of the organization that is represented in front of you today, the Association of Space Explorers. That's not just any organization you can join at will. You had to have flown in space, all right? So, Rusty, what do you have to tell us? Okay, thanks, Neil. Uh, one of the questions which uh, all of us get as soon as we talk to the public about 
this issue uh, is why in the world did you take this to the United Nations? Uh, I mean, the United States, Russia, all kinds of people have space programs. Uh, so why did you take it to the United Nations? And what I want to do is take just a moment uh, to answer that question. The right hand. Okay. Um, so uh, if you will imagine yourself to be an asteroid, uh, and from where you're sitting, you're headed toward the Earth, uh, and you are expected, uh, let's say, with a probability of one chance in ten of hitting the Earth. Uh, you don't hit it anywhere, but typically what you're going to have is a line like that red line uh, that crosses the Earth and in fact extends out left and right of the Earth. Picture the Earth moving from left to right and you're headed toward it. You're going to pass the Earth somewhere on that red line. Obviously, you may hit it or you may go out in front of the Earth to the right or behind it to the left. Uh, and let's imagine that you're going to hit right in the middle just in order to give you an example. Uh, if you're going to hit right in the middle uh, of the North Atlantic there, uh, and we now want to deflect this asteroid, the only way to deflect that asteroid, and I don't want to get technical, but I make it arrive a little bit early by, by uh, changing its orbit 10 or 15 years ahead of time, and that asteroid will then pass in front of the Earth or over in space to the right of the Earth and miss the Earth. Or I make it arrive late, in which case it passes to the left of the Earth and misses the Earth. But you can imagine that that impact, effectively what you're doing is dragging that impact off the Earth one way or the other. And of course, if you're going to make it arrive, miss the Earth to the right, you can see that if you drag that impact, it's going to go across England and Europe and Russia, who were not initially at risk if it hit in the middle of the Atlantic. If you're going to make it arrive late, it's going to go across parts of Canada and the United States. So the question is, which way do you move it? And if something goes wrong in the middle of the deflection, you have now caused havoc in some other nation that was not at risk. And therefore, this decision of what to do, how to do it, what systems to use, all of the rest of it, have to be coordinated internationally. And that's why this is an international issue, not just something for NASA in the United States or JAXA in Japan. This has to be coordinated. That's why we took this to the United Nations. So in 2005, our Association of Space Explorers um, decided, ha having finally figured this out after about three or four years, that this was the physical challenge, we took this to the United Nations. Um, we, we figured out it had to be international and eventually realized the Association of Space Explorers, a group of astronauts and cosmonauts, probably had the required credibility to elevate this issue to world leaders. And that's why we took this uh, to the United Nations. In 2006, we formed a distinguished international panel that helped us put together this report that Tom held up a few moments ago. This is available online. And I should point out that uh, Michael and, by the way, Franz van der Dunk, uh, Franz is an international space lawyer, among other uh, attributes. Uh, a number of international distinguished people helped us put together this report, which we delivered to the United Nations in 2008 and 2009. Uh, that is reaching the General Assembly now, this coming week and month, uh, and it will be adopted and become basically the skeleton of a decision-making process that will help us decide what to do if a threat arises. I say a skeleton because it has no meat or muscle on it yet. And that's the challenge for the next few years. Now before I finish, I want to do one other thing here. I want to, oop, there it goes. Okay, I want to remind all of us that this was the scene at Chelyabinsk on the 15th and 16th of February of this year. We're talking about real people, we're talking about death, we're talking about injuries, 
This is real stuff. And none of us want to see our grandchildren killed, let alone have glass flying in their faces. And that's why we're doing this work and why we have brought it to the United Nations. And we're very thankful that this is now being adopted by the world formally as a challenge. Thank you. Thanks, Rusty. When you say no meat on the bones, were you referring to no money? Yeah, is that is, is money synonymous with me money, meat? Money, actually, Neil, that's an excellent question. Money is hardly an issue in this. This is a very, very inexpensive thing to do. So it's uh, organizational then. It's, it's organizational. organizational. It's setting the actual criteria, thresholds, etc. This panel wouldn't be complete, especially in the wake of that February 15th explosion over Chelyabinsk in the Ural Mountains of Russia without having a Russian cosmonaut join this panel. And we're fortunate enough to have Doran Prunariu, who uh, represents uh, the Russia as a... Oh, Romania. Oh, Sorry. Romania, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> I flew with the Russians. You flew with the Russians, okay. Um, but uh, certainly uh, from... We're reminded that not only Americans have been in space, uh, we occasionally need to be reminded of that here in America. So thanks for joining us on this panel. Yeah. Thank you, Neil. So as long as you confused me with the Russian one, I could tell you that in the Association of Space Explorers, there are more than 370 cosmonauts, astronauts, taikonauts, spationauts, uh, in Japanese, you know, okay, uh, from 36 nations. Uh, I have the honor now to be the president of the association for one more year, but uh, most of the guys know me as the UN guy within the association because uh, uh, I connected first in 1992, the association with the UN in 1993, exactly 20 years ago, we became observer members of the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. And then, for therefore, we started to work actively uh, with the UN. And as you heard, uh, Rusty Schweikart presented our report in 2009, and this report became a working document of the UN. In 2004-2006, I had the honor to be the chairman of the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee uh, of the UN Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space. In 2010-2012, I was the president of the full committee, and I was followed then by Mr. Uh, Yasushi uh, Horikawa, who is here and representing officially the UN. Uh, most important thing when you th think about uh, asteroids, about uh, institutions, is how to organize the work. Uh, you may think that uh, within the UN we start to speak about asteroids only in 2007, 8, 9, but uh, the first uh, input was done by the 1999 Unispace Conference, United Nations Inter International Conference on Space, where the main direction of the uh, approach of the problem of the near-Earth objects was established. Therefore, in 2001, we established in the framework of the UN the so named Action Team on Near-Earth Objects, or Action Team 14. It's one of the action teams dealing with many problems that uh, impact uh, globally the humanity and one of them is the near-earth objects. In 2007, after several years of work of this action team, was established in the framework of the Scientific and Technical Committee a working group. The working group uh, addressed all nations involved in the work of the committee. And in this working group, we have the input and the working group only this year after several uh, years of hard work, international workshops, uh, discussions, debates, uh, issue a report. The report of the working group on near-earth objects was officially presented in February this year to the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee of the UN and in June uh, to the full committee and now we introduce this report to the General Assembly. Two days ago the report was endorsed by the working group of the General Assembly, and uh, for sure, it's no problem now, it's, we consider it's approved by the General Assembly, and it becomes mandatory for all nations to take measures in accordance with our recommendations. So, I'll pass the mic. 
thank you for that, reminding us of just what the administrative and cultural challenges are to make this, to make this work. Uh, next up is Ed Liu. He's actually a fellow astrophysicist. He's a shuttle era astronaut, and he's head of the B612 Foundation, correct. And we may hear some of that in your talk. If not, we'll surely get to it uh, afterwards. So Ed, what have you got to tell us? Okay, I wanted to show a quick movie. I want to show the challenge that we have. I want to show what we can do. And uh, if you could start this movie, this will set up the problem that we've got. And, it, and this is every single known asteroid in our solar system, correctly displayed. Okay, the light green line is the orbit of Earth. The outer belt there, you see, that's the asteroid belt. Um, the inner asteroids are the asteroids that Neil talked about, the near-Earth asteroids, near asteroids, and those are the ones that could hit the Earth. Um, there are about 10,000 known near-Earth asteroids. And, uh, you know, the, our challenge here is finding these things because in the end, we really want to do something, right? We don't want to just talk and hold meetings. In the end, we have to do something. What do you have to do? If you want to deflect an asteroid, if you want to protect everything that we've built as a civilization, you need to find them first. You cannot deflect an asteroid you haven't yet found. Here's the problem. There's 100 times more asteroids out there than we have found. This is really what the solar system looks like. There's about a million asteroids large enough to destroy New York City or larger out there. Okay, We know that there's about a million because we know we've only f surveyed a small volume of space. So our challenge and, and is to find these asteroids first before they find us. And I think uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the solution to that. Um, it's one of the recommendations in, in the Association of Space Explorers recommendations is to support the launch of a telescope that finds these things. And what the B612 Foundation Sentinel mission is going to do is be an infrared telescope which can see much larger areas of the solar system than our current telescopes can. So on the right is to show you what you can do with an infrared telescope if you put one in space uh, versus this little tiny area over here is, a, is the volume that we can see currently from, uh, from Earth right now. So we're building and launching an actual telescope in 2018, privately supported, that will find and track a million asteroids. And that will be how we, in the end, protect our planet. And that's our challenge. How do we find these things? Uh, Thanks, Ed. Just a quick question. Uh, why did it have to be privately funded? Were, 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 was the search for government funds un, uh, unyielding? The, the reason we're do, going about it that way is beca essentially because we can. Okay. The, the searches haven't been done yet. That, that's an irrefutable fact. And the technology exists. The know-how exists. And we realize that the cost of building and finding and tracking all these things, a telescope to do that is about what it costs to build a large freeway overpass. And that's within the capability of a private organization to do, so we decided that we would just do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, last among the panelists is Suichi Noguchi, and he's a, uh, acti actually an active astronaut with the Japanese Space Agency. And in fact, I just learned today, he has a weekly television program that uh, brings space to the Japanese public, and we welcome them here uh, to New York. Uh, so what do you have to tell us? Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, today I'm wearing two caps. The first cap is as the director of the Japanese astronaut office, and as an active astronaut, we are very concerned with the, the object, because anybody seen the movie Gravity these days? Gravity? Yeah, yeah, no. I don't want my colleague to be in that situation or doesn't want to happen on my next flight. So it's very interesting object. And the second cap is as a uh, president of AAC Asia. The Dorin is the international president. I serve as an Asian chapter. And as you know, uh, Asia Pacific region, including Siberia, is a very large area. And we see a uh, lot of uh, impact. So uh, there is an international interest in uh, finding those uh, impacts. So I'm going to show you how. You know, first of all, as Ed pointed out, the, the very first step is find where those uh, objects are, find and track. And uh, I guess this is the next one. And just want to show you the two uh, dedicated sites in Japan. That's the Space Guard Center 24-7 in conjunction with the U.S. assets. So uh, we have a dedicated uh, facility to track those uh, asteroids around the Earth. 
And the finding is one thing, and next is the, uh, all those uh, uh, monitoring on the ground side. Because, uh, like I said, there is an international interest. Once the disaster happens, uh, like to know where those uh, impact occurs, how big is the damage. So the, all the, uh, the space agencies shown behind me has an international charter, and which I just want to show you the, all the big schemes. Uh, look at those uh, international uh, 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 agencies working together to use their asset. The once disaster occurs, in, including the asteroid impact, they will quickly disseminate those information and each individual space agency to the best effort uh, bring those uh, data from space. And one of the, the asset is the International Space Station because the Japan has a big uh, uh, space, uh, uh, space station module. One of them has a HTTB, the high definition TV, looking down on Earth 24 seven, sending the data on, on the ground, what happens. So those data are used by the international partners to uh, quickly monitor and understand what's the disaster occurs. And the last thing, I, I don't have a slide, but for the uh, uh, deflection portion, uh, we do not have a deflection mission. However, Japan has a Hayabusa mission successfully conducted three years ago, which included the asteroid. Actually, we landed on the asteroid and get the sample returned back to Earth the first time ever in the, over, in the world. And next year, by the time next year, we're going to have a Hayabusa 2. We go to the different kind of asteroid. We do have an impact uh, onto the asteroid to see how the, we can sample the re uh, bring the sample back again. But Whatever the, deflection, whatever the deflection method occurs in the near future, we will need to be get near to the asteroid and find the exact location, either pushing or pulling or just uh, whatever to get the information. So that I, I fully believe that the Hayabusa 2 mission will contribute big to this uh, our activities. Thank you. All right, excellent. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, let me uh, take host liberties now and just sort of engage you in a quick set of questions and dialogue. Uh, in fact, let me, let me start off with uh, Dorian. Uh, Dorian, you, you commented how many different nationalities are represented in the Association of Space Explorers. I'm curious, as you go around the world, are, are all countries equally as interested in this problem? If you're a developing nation and you don't have an astronaut to cheer behind and you're worried about where your food is coming from, can you really expect them to rally behind this exercise? One or three? Okay. Not all of the nations are so interested in space activities. Uh, the main powers that have uh, big capabilities, they are involved in uh, the decision regarding the near-Earth objects, they are involved in the organization of the structures that will build future spacecraft to push the asteroids, but they are also develop developing na nations. They are interested in research in developing of their own countries. They are not so interested at this level in pushing asteroids uh, forward, backward. So uh, we have to mobilize them, to show them that each nation is important in this uh, outstanding endeavor. And uh, the UN does it. And the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, there are now 74 member states and more than 30 international organizations. And all this institutions belonging to these nations, space agencies, offices, uh, ministries, and so on, they should be mobilized to take part in a way or in the other way to our effort to discover first the asteroids and then to deflect. Uh, Rusty, I got a question for you. You speak, uh, met, met several of you have spoken, but especially we go back a few years, you've spoken to me at length about the challenges of administratively recognizing this problem. What I wonder is, in the end, is a collaborative effort really the most efficient way to do this? Shouldn't it just be like one agency who get it, gets it done and everybody sort of rallies behind that? Or do you end up getting what they say of camels, it's a, a horse designed by committee, right? Are committees a good thing in this is really what I'm getting at. Well, efficiency is not always the prime criteria for something of this kind when you're dealing with the lives of people who 
um, have no relationship to the institution, you might want to do it. I mean, are you going to have the United States push an asteroid away, but push it across Russia before it goes off the Earth? Or are we going to sit around and be happy with the Russians pushing an asteroid, the impact point, across the United States on the way off the Earth? So this has to be coordinated whether we find that the most efficient way or not. There has to be international trust in what's going to be done. The biggest problem, Neil, right now, uh, institutionally, is not so much with the United Nations, although the United Nations has a lot of work to do, but no government in the world today has explicitly assigned the responsibility for planetary deflection to any of its agencies. NASA does not have an explicit responsibility to deflect an asteroid, nor does any other space agency. And so, that so there's not even a, there's not even a seed planted where you can grow that into something that would work. We have to birth this from scratch, is what you're saying. Well, I don't want to be biblical, <laughs> but we did cast seeds around, but they didn't seem to grow. There wasn't. <laughs> The seeds were there, but the water didn't follow. Okay. Neil, that's why the B612 Foundation exists in some sense, because there was an action, and it is within the capability, again, of, of private individuals to get the ball rolling. You know, I, in the end, we want it, we're going to give this data away. We're going to make it public. Data on where all the asteroids are that yes, you find. That's going to be public. It's going to go out to all the astronomers of the world simultaneously. And we want to get, make this decision making problem relevant, because it's not relevant if you can't find them, again. But efficiency matters when you're running projects, okay? Efficiency isn't necessarily the prime criterion for decision-making among nations, but for running a project, getting the data, yes, efficiency matters, and that's why we're doing it. Tom, the, if you try to bring the whole world into this, how would you do it? Are you imagining some kind of a tax on a GDP per capita? How, what, <laughs> What, what, in practice, how does this get paid for? Emperor Jones. <laughs> well, it would be nice to have, you know, it would be nice if there was uh, so much international interest that we'd already formed a consortium to mount a future deflection campaign and that was standing by. That hasn't happened yet. And I think the, the whole purpose of today's press conference really was to bring to uh, the UN's attention and to the international spacefaring nation's uh, attention these next vital steps that we have to take. And, to, you know, this will... Funding will follow where we have the determination and the willpower to uh, execute these steps. So, Josh, if you could bring up my last slide again. It has the vital steps. We could bring those up. And I just want to mention them because the Association of Space Explorers has been involved with trying to raise the attention profile on this hazard that we all face globally. And we've succeeded in getting the UN to uh, adopt certain steps to warn us and to take advantage of our disaster preparation capabilities. But we really need to go farther. We need to maintain this momentum now that we've achieved this milestone. And so here are the five steps we're recommending today in our statement. And that is first, you know, to your point, Neil, about funding, we've got to get the UN delegations to brief their policymakers on how this is a real hazard and how they should take advantage of these actions that have been taken and address them back home. Number two, we've got to have the policymakers around the world address their asteroid impacts in planning for disasters in their home country. They deal with tsunamis, they deal with floods, they deal with earthquakes. They should include asteroid impacts. So this is a planning exercise. And that doesn't cost much money. Finally, uh, not finally, but number three, this is uh, something that Rusty mentioned. We've got to assign lead responsibility in each nation around the world for dealing with an asteroid impact. Appoint an agency that's going to collaborate with the others around the world to deal with detection and a future deflection campaign. Somebody has to be assigned responsibility. Number four, governments have to contribute funds, and this is a small amount. If they pool their funds together, less than half a billion dollars over 10 years, they could actually support a telescope like Ed's been talking about, an infrared telescope to find the million hazardous asteroids that are out there. And so that's a technical step that can be done by pooling resources with real promise of success in the near term. And finally, uh, we would like to call for an international deflection mission where the nations of the world the spacefaring countries, supported by the other states, actually pull their funds and fly a mission to a harmless asteroid 
and move it enough to guarantee that it would miss Earth had it been on a, an impact trajectory. So a real demonstration in space of what we've been talking about to put this plan into action, have it on the shelf and be ready. You don't want to deflect a harmless asteroid into a collision path. That would be bad. That would be bad, and I hope we're smart enough to avoid that. But these five steps, if we continue this momentum that we've built up here at the UN this fall and over the last few years, we can really uh, ensure the survival of our species. Suichi, you had a comment. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, just a quick thing. I was in uh, Dubai, UAE, until Tuesday, and I have a different uh, UN uh, technological symposium. I was talking to like a student from like Sudan and Sri Lanka. They're all interested in this kind of asteroid impact. How do we find it? How can we live through it? And I think this is our obviously noble solution, noble, I mean, a noble uh, obligation for all those, uh, you know, the international partners around the space station, all those uh, companies who has the, the asset to uh, point and find and track and uh, let the, the rest of the world know that we have, uh, you know, uh, the, the impact coming. Neil, you might want to ask about the cost of this. Rusty, what does this cost? <laughs> Glad you asked that question, Neil. <laughs> Um, yeah, you might think that this is expensive. Uh, Tom and I ran a task force for NASA about three years ago, uh, and we looked, among other things, at the cost of setting up a program that would provide planetary defense. And uh, basically the answer is for the first 10 years when you're doing a lot of preliminary work, it costs just a little bit over 1% of the NASA budget. One sixth Just over 1%. After the first 10 years, that drops back to less than one half of 1% of NASA's budget. This is not expensive. This is taking responsibility for the survival of life on planet Earth. It's not costly. Thank you for that. I'll, I'll, You're welcome. I'll, I have one last question and we'll go Glad to the press. Glad you asked. Oh. <laughs> Uh, I have one last question I'm going to direct it to Ed, and then we'll take questions from the press. Uh, Ed, it's been assumed in this conversation that the way to save Earth is to deflect an asteroid rather than to just blow it out of the sky. All right, all the movies tell us that's what we should do is blow it out and of the sky. And movies are always accurate, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> so um, is there a leading way we would be deflecting asteroids? Because, as you know, asteroid... Um, the, the structural integrity of asteroids is not a well understood problem. So how they would don't you... all look like this one back here. Right, this one is a solid, the Willamette meteorite. If you push it, it the whole thing is going to move. But there might be asteroids out there where you push apart and that breaks off and you miss the rest of it. So is there a leading idea about how you would deflect them so that you don't run into those kinds of problems? Well, again, if you can find these things so that you know that they're in advance they're going to hit decades before they're going to hit, it's actually we have a lot of options. It's actually fairly simple. You know, let's say that thing is going to hit the Earth. Let's make it its cousin 10,000 times larger. Let's say it's going to hit the Earth 10 years from now. That thing is traveling around in space like the Earth, which is a moving target. It has, still has 6 billion miles to travel before it hits the Earth. You don't need to change its speed by very much to make it miss because that is an incredible shot. I mean, the amazing thing is that, that NASA has figured out, scientists have figured out, astronomers have figured out how to track things accurately enough that we know 10 years in advance when something's going to hit, if you can see it. So all you, all you re the simplest thing you, have to, you can do is simply run into it with a small spacecraft. That's been done before. Again, we've got to give ourselves a fighting chance. Did you just say finding. run into it? Like just yep. bump it? And we have like more elegant billions, right? than this? Yeah, and if you, uh, we can give it a fancy name, they call them kinetic impactors, if that makes you feel better. But the, the change kinetic in... Imp that's what happened to the car, it was a kinetic yeah. impact. Yes, yes. Okay. indeed, and not yes, covered by honor. insurance. Yes. Okay. So, so we, can, we can do that step. All right. Good and, to know. You know, I, I, I just want folks to think, I see some kids out here in the audience, I mean, think about how amazing what we're talking about is doing, you know. We're talking about what the ability to find, you know, black, black things in space, track them accurately enough so we know where they're going to be, you know, up to 100 years from now, accurate enough to know if they're going to hit the Earth, going out there, flying rockets out there, changing their trajectory ever so slightly so they miss the Earth. I mean, if you think about all the steps involved, all the things, this is like the culmination of all of our space knowledge. I mean, all of us here have been lucky enough to be involved in some of the great space projects. Um, and, you know, at least for me personally, that's been 
you know, a highlight of my life. But I can't think of anything more important than to do this. My, my favorite poster on the internet I saw recently is, shows a, a stylized spacecraft and an asteroid, and it says, asteroids, nature's way of asking, how's that space program coming along? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the press if you have any questions. Please identify your, uh, who you represent when you do. Oh, we have a, oh, take that. Here. Here, thank you. Please identify your, your journal. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. My name is Kahraman Halis Selik. I'm with uh, Turkey's national broadcaster, uh, Turkish Radio and Television. And now, uh, this is actually wonderful. Thank you very much for this. Uh, are there a riskier uh, spots in the world in the case that these asteroids hit the world? Is, for example, the north of the world is more riskier than the, the south or the east from the west? How, how do you define it? They all, they all hit Russia. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, no it's, it's, you random. It? It's, it's random. It's random. Right. Okay. Yeah, so Look at the moon. Look at the craters on the moon. They're, they're cover, they cover that entire body. We just don't see the craters that have struck Earth because of Earth's uh, dynamic geology that erases a lot of those craters. But yeah, they're randomly distributed. In, in terms of national concern, the country with the largest cross-sectional area uh, has the highest probability, but it's Russia. it's a uniform thing. Yeah, yeah Russia. Or the the most don't look at the lines. movies. In the movies, all asteroids fall down in the U.S., and in reality, they fall down in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> also, in uh, I think it was in the movie Armageddon, uh, those asteroids had really good aim. You know, they were hitting national landmarks and things. So that. Uh, <laughs> Those are movie asteroids. Neil, yeah. one, one uh, serious answer to the question, though, is that the Earth is you know, mostly ocean, water. And uh, if an asteroid is something on the order of 150 meters or larger in diameter, it will cause a tsunami. And so actually, uh, the damage to life and property from tsunamis historically has probably been the largest uh, uh, phenomena. Just because it falls in water doesn't make it a safe impact. Uh, another question, yes. Hi, Clara Moskowitz for Scientific American. You're talking about deflecting an asteroid that's five or ten years out from hitting us, but what if we find one that's a year away or six months? How quickly could we mobilize a deflection mission if we needed to? In fact, if I can add to that, you, none of you have discussed comets. You have long period comets that come in out of the blue, out of the dark, and we don't even know they're there until they pass Jupiter. And at that point, they're barreling into the inner solar system. We have months to mobilize, not even years. So, what do you, yeah. Clara, thanks for the question. And Neil, we're going to ignore your comment. Then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that, that, it's an excellent question. And the best answer to your question is, if we discover something only a year out, then we probably haven't done the job that Ed keeps you know, pushing here, which is, Find, you know, Don Yeomans at JPL, whom I'm sure you know, uh, Don says the three most important things if you want to protect the Earth from asteroid impacts are one, find them early, two, find them early, and three, find them early. And when you find them early, that means, as Ed said, you can predict ahead a hundred years that something may hit the Earth and get ready for it. If we don't find it until a year out, Make yourself a nice cocktail and go out and watch, okay? Or better, the better answer is you evacuate the impact area. In other words, Which generally works for speaking, very small asteroids only. Small asteroids are the ones that are going to hit us the most frequently, by far. And therefore, with a small one, you're probably not going to spend the money to go up and deflect it. You are probably, number one, going to find it later and just before impact, and you can then evacuate. That's part of the process that we've outlined here for the United Nations. So you're really saying you got nothing for comets here. Well, no. hang on a second. First off, you know, what Rusty said is correct, but I think we can do better, right? Let's not put ourselves in that spot, okay? 100 years ago, if the Earth was hit by an asteroid, as it was in Tunguska, a 10 megaton explosion Russia. in Russia, um, that's bad luck. If we get hit again 20 years from now, that is not bad luck, that is stupidity, okay? We can do better as, as a race. I don't want humans to be the laughing stock of the galaxy having gone extinct from an asteroid when we had an active space program that could have prevented it. Right. 
Uh, next N question. Neil, hey, let yeah. me ask you a question. Yeah. We have looked at this issue of comets versus asteroids. Asteroids are 99% of the threat. Comets are about 1%, and they are by far much more difficult to find ahead of time and predict exactly what's going to happen to them. So it's a, it's a different threat. We're going to solve 99% of the problem, then we're going to go to comets. We're not going to forget you. It's like saying, Th I'm not going to work on solving heart disease because I can't solve the problem of cancer. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Yes. Hi, Laura Popic from space.com. I was just wondering if you guys could speak on how the impact in Russia earlier this year sort of galvanized public interest in this and how you can keep that going in the future. Tom, you got this. Well, the Association of Space Explorers and our committee was at the UN on February 15th when we were discussing near-Earth asteroid impacts and the Chelyabinsk event occurred. So that focused everybody's attention rather wonderfully. That's in kind the, of suspicious, in the committee actually. Room. Doreen was there. And, Tom, and, that's a little suspicious. I think it was Doreen's doing, actually. You want to, you want to address that? <laughs> One, two, okay. Uh, actually, we were looked for another asteroid in that day, 15 of uh, February this year. And in the morning, we just heard the news that an asteroid hit Russia, hit Chelyabinsk, uh, near Urals. Um, actually, the asteroid had a dimension of about 17 meters in diameter, but a very high energy, and the speed of the asteroid was about 20 meters per second. Kilo kilometers. Uh, kilometers per second, yes. Uh, you transform it in miles, uh, okay, it's your job. And uh, you have seen, even if the asteroid uh, fall down about 80, 85 kilometers from the city. He broke all the windows in the city and hurt more than 1,000 persons. And it had a diameter only of 17 meters. In 2000, in uh, 1,908, uh, the Tunguska asteroid was about 45 meters in diameter and put down uh, 2,000 square kilometers of forest. And the visual and acoustical effects were uh, felt far till England. So do you understand what means an asteroid of 100 meters or 200 meters or even worse? It did make a difference, I think, in, in policymakers realizing that this is not just a science fiction concept or something that will happen 100 or 500 years in the future. The fact that it happened right now when the UN's been talking about it, I think, reinforced its reality. And I hope that, in addition to the congressional hearings in the U.S. that we've seen in the past uh, six months or so, that we'll continue to see the policymakers, as we recommend, bringing this uh, asteroid hazard into their disaster planning and then, of course, getting on board with a deflection mission. The, and and the what's interesting is that, that in Chelyabinsk, uh, we had more than 1,000 injuries, but I think no one died. Is that correct? So it's the ideal shot across the bow. You recover from it, and you are, you are snapped into... Uh, sensitivity to the problem. The real issue, however, is not just policymakers being aware that this is an issue, but having specific things, specific actions that they can take. And the reason that we're here today is because we have identified, as the professionals who've been looking at this, um, albeit uh, nonprofit professionals, but nevertheless, uh, these are five very specific actions that we can recommend that people seeing the effect of Chelyabinsk can actually implement. That's the important thing. Does anybody know, here know how the agency, space agencies of the world found out about the asteroid impact? Twitter. Twitter and YouTube. Mm -hmm. From all the forward-facing cameras yeah. that uh, filmed it and then posted, yeah. Again, so what, okay. is, is no, that no, unacceptable? I think the answer is yes. So one more thing a few decades ago, Nobody could believe that private industry will be involved in space. Everything was about governments, everything was about space agencies and so on. And now, the big responsibility of defending the Earth should belong to the governments. But see, a private institutions, the foundation B612 foundations, build its own telescope to discover the asteroids and to defend the world. So the responsibility of such things now belong to all humankind not only to governments. And we have to be aware of this and act in this respect. That's an excellent point. Uh, who's next with the microphone? Yes, sir. Alexey Vespov from Komsomolskaya Pravda, Russia. So how active is my country in your association? 
or other activity in this field? Because you repeated so many times today, Russia, 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 <laughs> but nothing practical I didn't hear. So actually, Russia, it's part of the uh, Action Team 14 of the United Nations. Uh, Russia, it's uh, taking part in a lot of international workshops, conferences, uh, dedicated to the defense of the Earth against the asteroids. Uh, you have some very good specialists, uh, but you have also some persons uh, uh, involved at a high level that think that we could defend the Earth just bombing the asteroids. Uh, actually, they have to take part more in our in discussions at the international level, in the research at the international level, and to see how really could defend the Earth. Now, uh, after the Chelyabinsk event, uh, the new head of the, space, the Russian Space Agency of Roscosmos declared that they are focused on a program dedicated to defense of Earth against asteroids. I'm quite sure they will interact at the international level to find out exactly how to do it and what is the level of research in this respect. Thank you. I will say that um, some of our private donors to the B612 Sentinel mission are Russian. So there are individual Russians taking steps to solve the problem. And I'm told uh, these days there's no shortage of Russian billionaires, right? So there's money to possibly tap, still tap. Uh, any other questions? Since the press has no more questions, I guess we'll go to some of the kids. Yes. Um, what what your name and what grade you're in? Um, I'm Alex Palameni, grade eight. Um, and are you cutting school right now? Yes. This is an awesome reason to cut class. Yeah. <laughs> okay. If, um, you need, if you need a whole pass later, I'll write you one. Okay. okay thanks. Good. So what do you, you have? You can do that. Um, <laughs> what expendable rocket boosters will be used for the telescope and um, deflection missions? Yeah. So you got a launch vehicle planned out for this? The launch vehicle in uh, July of 2018 is a Falcon 9 built by SpaceX. And the and same and for the deflection missions. You don't need a giant rocket to carry out these missions. You, t you typically have to loft a spacecraft that might have you know, a 10 or 20 ton mass. And uh, that's plenty enough to run into an asteroid and have an observer spacecraft fly alongside and watch the results of that impact. So it requires just a middle-sized booster. Uh, another question. Apropos of his question, can you, once it's launched, can you redirect it or you can control it from? Right, like any planetary exploration mission, a probe to Mars or to Pluto, these spacecraft, we know how to guide them very precisely and they have maneuvering engines to make a rendezvous if necessary with the asteroid and then of course to guide you right into a collision if we use kinetic impact as a technique. And to make corrections if something changes in the orbit. That's right. Presumably, yeah. In the back there, yes. Hi there. Uh, I'm actually a volunteer here at the AMNH, uh, uh, usually discussing the uh, victims of the last really large, really large extinction event uh, so the, from the space. The skull, you have someone's skull in your hand, yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, uh -huh. technically it's a cougar, but I uh, use that to show evolution. Anyway, mm -hmm. the point is, uh, we're talking a lot about uh, smaller asteroid impacts. What would we do, what do we have available in our arsenal if there was something, say, of the Chicxulub crater that killed the dinosaurs? What, uh, you know, do our connecting impactors have that ability to stop that? Rusty, what do you have? Well, uh, this, this is an excellent question, uh, but you have to get into probabilities. I hate to say that. Uh, the frequency with which the event you just suggested happens is about once every 100 million years. So it's probably not something that we want to really rush to get ready for. Uh, I mean, there are many, many other uh, accidents, like the Tunguska event, which happens about once every 300 years. And those will destroy New York City or any city in the world. And when I say destroy, I mean kill everyone, OK? Uh, the, the US Congress labeled them city killers. And those are the ones which are thousands of times, uh, millions of times more frequent than an extinction event that wiped out the dinosaurs. Uh, the deflection techniques that we have uh, deal with things up to about 400 
meters in diameter or so. When you get larger than that, you either need to have a series of deflection events or potentially use a nuclear explosion event. But hopefully we'll have much better techniques in the next hundred million years before the next <laughs> one appears. Or, or just That's think, wishful just, thinking just, at the just rate think we're about going. This for a second. I, I if just, you, okay, yeah. if, you, if, if I mean. you can hit it with a kinetic impactor, you can hit it with 10 or 100 of them, right? And I will submit to you that if we are finding a, an asteroid that's going to wipe out all life on Earth or the majority of life on Earth, that funding is not an issue for launching 100 of them. Uh, besides that, I want to point out that if the probability to hit the Earth is once in 300 years, if, let's say, tomorrow an asteroid like that will fall down, the next one will not wait for 300 years. It could fall down on the next day, and then 600 years will be nothing. So it's just a statistical thing. Uh, could fall down any time, but in time, if you count it in millenniums maybe, the statistic says that every 300 years it's one. The other important Thank thing you. about your question is that an object that large, by the way, the one that wiped out the dinosaurs, was something like eight miles in diameter. It was not a small rock. Eight miles in the diameter. The size of Mount Everest, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. oh, bigger than, yeah. than Mount Everest, actually, quite a bit bigger. Okay. Um, you're going to see that a long, long, long time before it hits. In fact, we already know of all that we think that we, <laughs> I said, we think that we know of all of those in the whole solar system today. In fact, there's only about two or maybe even one. Uh, so we're not going to be surprised by something that large, and we will have lots of time to worry about it or mix our martinis or whatever we're going to do. Unless it's a comet. <laughs> uh, in, the film a Armag in the film Armageddon, the asteroid that they discovered was the size of Texas and they had only just discovered it, which means they're living in a universe where no one was ever looking up, because uh, an asteroid that size would have been discovered in the 1800s. So yeah, size matters here in terms of how early you can get it. Uh, we've run out of time. Uh, the panel will be available for uh, press one-on-ones over in our uh, press pa uh, pen in the back. I want to thank all of you for coming, and I want to thank the internet for tuning in and uh, being concerned about this problem that affects us all. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson. Signing off, thank you, panelists, for this.